My name is Krista Gear. I'm the Executive Director here at Active Aging, and I'm honored to welcome you all here today on this special day that's set aside to remind us all to appreciate those who defend and protect in circumstances they do not choose for reasons they may not completely understand. A few years ago, while visiting Gettysburg, I walked a path in front of the monument of General Robert E. Lee and the path follows along the woods to a point where a huge field opens up in front of you. This field was the site of Pickett's Charge on July 3rd, 1863. Standing there, I was completely awestruck. I tried to imagine the Confederate soldiers who crossed that field during that charge, marching towards several thousand Union soldiers hell-bent on stopping them. I could not fathom the courage and bravery of those men who gave their lives on that hallowed ground. I do not think that courage is the absence of fear. Courage is determination to overcome that fear and move forward in spite of it. There is no ceremony, no accolades, and no amount of appreciation that could ever repay our brave veterans for all that they willingly give to keep our nation free. You're the reason that we're here today, and I hope that you end this day with the knowledge that you are appreciated and you are valued. Thank you so much for your service. I have the honor also of introducing uh, Melody Seedor from Vantage. Uh, they're part of our sponsorship today, and she'd like to say a few words also. Good morning. Good morning, welcome and thank you. I'm honored to be speaking with you today on such an important occasion. We are here today to honor our service members and to remember their sacrifices that they made to defend our country. As President Ronald Reagan said in his 1983 Memorial Day address, we are forever indebted to those who have given their lives that we might be free. We are here today to honor our heroes to remember their achievements, their courage, their dedication, and to say thank you for their sacrifices. Thinking of the heroes who join us in this group today and others who are here only in spirit, a person can't help but feel awed by the enormity of what we encounter. We stand in the midst of patriots and the family and friends of those who have nobly served it is your service and sacrifice that has kept our country safe and free. No matter which branch you served in, whatever your job path, or how many years you served, committing yourself to service in the military was a brave and selfless act, one that resulted in very few guarantees of where you would be assigned, whether and where you might deploy, and in some cases, if you would return home in one piece or at all. Military men and women know those risks, but they accept them in many cases so that we don't have to. Thank you for taking the time to remember our heroes. They never gave up on us, and we can't give up on them. God bless you all, bless our veterans, and bless the United States of America. So we will be uh, having Larry Peters uh, come forward and provide us with the invocation. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you and we praise you for your providence and blessing upon the United States of America and its people. We pray for forgiveness in ways that we have been wrong. We pray for guidance and restoration to be and to do that which pleases you and, to, and honors you. Today we also want to honor our veterans, men and women who in their military service gave their best when called upon to serve and protect this country. 
in getting their best, we recognize that they are America's best. We are grateful for them who in their service have sacrificed time, comfort, strength, ambition, health and prosperity for the peace and safety of family and friends, those they love, and others they have never even known before. We honor and recognize National Guard and reservists who in the tradition of Minutemen and militia have fought engagements and have defended towns from Lexington and Concord as they serve and protect our towns and villages and our country to this day. From the freezing winter at Valley Forge to the scorching heat of a desert battlefield, our veterans have chosen to endure sacrifice, service, and abundant hardships. We want our veterans to know that we very much appreciate them. We respect them, we thank them, we love them, we are proud of them. And God, we pray that you will watch over these special people and bless them and reward them. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. And now post 2006 and Vietnam's veteran post 52 will raise the flag. to fight for our country. So please join me as a group in singing our national anthem.
through the perilous fight. For the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we can go inside and enjoy breakfast. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of the membership and the officers of Veterans of the Vietnam War Post 52, happy Veterans Day. Thank you for your service. The missing man ceremony. Please direct your attention to the table placed in front of us. It is a physical symbol of the thousands of American POWs and MIAs still unaccounted for from all foreign conflicts. We would ask uh, that you reflect in silent prayer for those warriors who have yet to find their way home. Thank you. Now we would like to explain the symbolism of this ceremony as the veterans of the Vietnam War Post 52 Honor Guard places items upon the table. Those who have served and those who are currently serving in the uniformed services of the United States of America are ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and imprisonment. A reminder for us all to spare no effort to secure the release of any American prisoners from captivity the repatriation of the remains of those who died bravely in defense of liberty, and demanding a full accounting of those missing in action. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and families, so we join together to pay humble tribute to them and to bear witness to their continued absence. The table is small, symbolizing the helplessness of one prisoner alone against his or her oppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms.
our comrades are missing from the United States Army. Our comrades are missing from the United States Navy. Our comrades are missing from the United States Air Force. Our comrades are missing from the United States Marine Corps. Our comrades are missing from the United States Coast Guard. The single rose in the vase signifies the blood they may have shed and sacrificed to ensure the freedom of our beloved United States of America. This rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrades who keep faith while awaiting their return. The red ribbon on the vase represents the red ribbons worn on the lapels of thousands who demand with unyielding determination a proper accounting of our comrades who are not among us. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless volunteers of families as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us at this time. The Bible is placed prominently on the table. The Bible represents the strength gained through faith to sustain those lost from our country. The United States was founded as one nation under God. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is representative and of the light of hope that lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors to the open arms of a grateful nation.
The American flag reminds us that many of them may never return and have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. Let us pray to the supreme commander that all of our comrades will soon be back within our ranks. Let us remember and never forget their sacrifices. May God watch over them and protect them and their families. And may each of us live worthy of their sacrifices in the way that we love and serve. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, we're going to begin our presentation of Quilts of Valor. This is uh, Ms. Colleen Munn. She's going to tell you what the program's about. Good morning. Happy Veterans Day to you all. My name is Colleen Munn, and I am with PA Sisters of Valor, your local chapter of the National Quilts of Valor Foundation. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us to be a part of your Through the Veterans Eye ceremony today. Today we will be awarding five Quilts of Valor to veterans that have been nominated by family, friends, um, social groups, but, we, but before we do that, I would like to take time to recognize all of our veterans that are present with us today. So if you are a veteran, would you please stand for me, please? How are you? <laughs> Thank you, you may be seated. Thank you for your service. Quilts of Valor is a national foundation that was started in 2003 by a grassroots quilter, Catherine Roberts, when her son was deployed to Iraq. She saw quilts as a way to provide comfort and healing to veterans battling the demons of war. Our mission is to present Quilts of Valor to servicemen and women and veterans touched by war. Since 2003, over 233,000 Quilts of Valor have been awarded across the United States, Germany, Afghanistan, and Iraq. How PA Stachers got started? In 2016, I made and presented my first two quilts of valor to my niece and her husband upon their retirement from the United States Navy. Shortly after that, I was contact contacted by the National Foundation asking if I could help with a nomination in our area. I said I could. Shortly thereafter, I was contacted by them again and asked if I could help with another nomination. I hesitated because I hadn't started the first one yet, and it's been a couple weeks, and I'm thinking, I don't know. I said, how much time do I have? And they said, you have six months to a year. I said, okay, I'll take the second one. Shortly after that, I was contacted again for the third time, and I knew I needed help. I spoke to the Free Spirit Quilt Guild in Sagertown, which I belong to, and told them about the program, told them about my niece and nephew and their quilts, and I had showed them to them before I presented them. And the guild president, Kim Templin, said, let's do it as a service project in 2017. We joined National in April of 2017 with our first presentation in May of 2017, where we presented 11 quilts of valor as quilts of valor on that day. As of yesterday, we have awarded 210 quilts locally. What that means is that we have honored 
210 veterans in this area for their time and service with the United States Armed Forces. Notice I said we awarded these quilts. These quilts are not charity quilts or something that you buy and hand out. The quilts are lovingly crafted by volunteers. We work individually, but we also have frequent sew days to work as a group. During those sew days is when our laughter and tears are sewn into the quilts that we are going to present as we talk about our veterans that we have presented to or to our family member about our family members that have served or are serving. We share the stories of what I've heard from all the veterans I've already talked to and the things that they've gone through when they came back from the service. I'm going to ask Marcia Waite to come up and join me. Each quilt has three layers, and each layer has a meaning to us. The top of the quilt, with its many colors, shapes, fabrics, represents the community and the many individuals that we are in it. The batting, or the filler of the quilt, is the center of the quilt. It represents our hope that the quilt will bring warmth, comfort, peace, and healing to the individual that receives it. The back of the quilt, is the strength of the quilt. It supports all the other layers. It represents the strength of the recipient, the support of his or her family, our communities, and our nation. Each stitch that holds the quilt together represents the love, gratitude, and often the tears of the maker. It brings a three-part message from our hearts. First, we honor you for your service. We honor you for leaving all that you hold dear, whether in a time of crisis or in a time of peace. Second, the quilters know that freedom is not free. The cost is the dedication of lives of men and women like you. And the quilt is meant to say thank you for your sacrifice and service. Third, and finally, this quilt is meant to offer comfort and to remind you that although our family and friends cannot be with you at all times, you are always in our thoughts and prayers. It is an honor to award the following individuals with their quilt of valor. As I call your name, would you please come up and bring a family member with you? I'm going to also ask the ladies from the PA Stitchers if you'll come up and take your place behind the quilts. Did it go off? Okay, this morning we're going to start with Corporal Richard W. Nichols. Mr. Nichols, will you please come forward? <laughs> Richard enlisted in the United States Army from 1949 to 1952 during the Korean War. He drove ambulance and helped evacuate hospitals stationed in Patoon. 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 Sorry. <laughs> he went to Korea on the USS James O'Hare, which was the little ship, and it took, he took top bunk in the hull of the ship. His bunkmates couldn't figure out why he took top bunk, and after they were out to sea and the other guys were vomiting from seasickness, he missed it. They understood. You can have it turn around. He served with the Turks that helped evacuate the field hospitals and helped the wounded back to Seoul. On the way back, the Turks led the way, and the commander in the front truck was shot from over the hill. The Turks abandoned their trucks and drew their swords and wept the hill they went after the person that shot them. He never served with them again. Corporal Richard R. Nichols. <laughs> 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 
Sergeant First Class John H. Haliva, sure. retired. John enlisted in the United States Army from May 1977 to June 1997 during Desert Storm. He was an aviation mechanic, platoon sergeant, and an acting sergeant major. He did five overseas deployments and six stateside deployments. Sergeant First Class John A. Haluva. I will tell you that I, as a civilian, it's, uh, and I get their information over the phone and stuff, I'm trying to write frantically, so some of it is close as I can get it. Sorry. <laughs> and I will apologize. Radio Men First Class Service Warfare designated Richard Littlefield. Richard was enlisted in the United States Army from 1969 to 19... Army. Navy, sorry. <laughs> that was really bad. I'm really sorry. Thanks, Colleen. <laughs> that was a really bad mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the Navy's dear to my heart, too, so sorry. Um, the United States Navy from 1969 to 1990. He did his basic training in Great Lakes. He was a plank owner of the USS Mac McInerney. McInerney served the USS Fox, USS Bauer, USS Horn in Vietnam, and where he had made four passes up and down the coast of Vietnam. His home fort was in San Diego, California. He did two tours of naval recruitment and served on the NETC Communication School in Newport, Rhode Island from 1988 to 99. I will tell you, as a poll worker, he is always the first person at the door. He wants to be the first voter at our precinct. And he actually helped me break into Westbury this, this election because they don't open the door till 6.30. And I was there at six o'clock, so we opened the door and got in. But uh, Radio Men First Class Surface Warfare designated Richard Littlefield. I was stationed in Antarctica for one year. No. You needed more than twelve. <laughs> Uh, 50 degrees below zero. <laughs> R.J. Anthony. I was looking at your hat when you were coming up. <laughs> okay. Mr. Anthony served from 1956 to 1978 with the United States Navy. His basic training was Bainbridge, Maryland. He worked on the FBF submarines. He retired after 21 years. He has a plaque with him with all the different ships and submarines that he was assigned to. said he worked on the ship, the subs, but wouldn't go out in one. He wouldn't go on a boat that sinks. <laughs> R.J. Anthony. Wayne Burnett.
Mr. Burnett enlisted with the United States Air Force from 1962 to 1964. I had the right branch, right? 65. To 65 during the Vietnam War. He worked with the Air Police at that time. Wayne Burnett. At this time, you will be wrapped in what is called a quilting hug. On one side of the quilt will be a family member. On the other side will be a quilter. Quilts of Valor are not given to you like a book or a magazine, but with a hug. You have become part of our quilting family and will forever be in our hearts. The reason for the quilting hug is so that you, when you are feeling alone, battling the demons of war, or just having a bad day, you again can wrap the quilt around yourself and feel the hug that you have just received. And remember that you are not alone. You have the love and support and gratitude of all of us, family, friends, quilters, community, and nation. On behalf of PA Stitchers of Valor and the entire Quilts of Valor family and a grateful nation with our deepest appreciation, we thank you for your service to our country. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Sorry. With each quilt comes a certificate. Marsha, can you get not in order. They're not in order. The certificate states the Quilts of Valor Foundation wishes to recognize you for your service to our nation. We consider it a privilege to honor you, though we may never know the extent of your sacrifice and service to protect and defend the United States as an expression of gratitude. Again, we'd like to thank the Through the Eyes Committee for having us today. Thank you, veterans, for your service. And it has been an honor for us to be here today and award these quilts of valor. Thank you again. Happy Veterans Day. Quilters. Thank you, veterans. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the day, Glenn Umberger, Jr. He's an Army veteran. He served 33 plus years. He is also the former commander of the Pennsylvania Veterans of Foreign War Force, and I'll let him come and tell you more. Okay, good morning everyone and let me start off by saying thank you for your service to all the uh, veterans that are in attendance today. And while I'm saying thank you, let's recognize VFW Post 2006, the Vietnam Veterans Post 52, the staff here, and the Quilts of Valor Stitchers for all that they've done to bring together today's ceremony. So thank you all for what you've done. We've heard some portions of very interesting stories already this morning. And as we sit around the table and commune, 
we talk about our shared experiences. And that's what I'd like to do today, is to share some of my story with you. I have uh, been a citizen soldier. I've been an Army Reservist for over 33 and a half years. Thank you very much. And it's the story that I have is going to be very similar to the story that you have. A love and a passion of patriotism, of honor and respect, community and support. Events like these today are becoming more and more important because there are some out there today that want to change history. They want to erase history. Those gathered here and around this great country worked hard, fought hard, did good things, and probably did a few bad things along the way. However, we learned from all of those events. And those lessons that we learned must continue to be shared, otherwise we will be doomed to repeat them. As I've traveled across the country, both as an Army Reservist, as a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and as a member of a uh, civilian employee of the Department of the Army, I've got to see the impact that we each bring through our shared service and our shared experiences. Yeah. Back in uh, 1985, I was still a junior in high school uh, in northern Lebanon, right outside of Fort Indian Town Gap here in Pennsylvania. And uh, really wasn't thinking about joining the Army. And just through a series of happenstance, I decided to talk to a recruiter, talk to my family, and soon after completing my junior year of high school, off I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky for uh, my basic training. It was a very interesting year. Uh, Kentucky held some of the coldest rain I had ever experienced, especially for the month of July. You'd expect it to be warm, muggy, nah. At 5.30 in the morning, that was, ice, that was the ice challenge of the day, uh, doing your uh, run, full gear, uh, through the Kentucky rain. But it was uh, an interesting time in my life. Uh, really didn't know where I was going to go, what I was going to do. As I said, I was still a junior in high school. Upon graduating basic training, I had returned to high school and complete my senior year. And so I did that. From there, I proceeded off, once I graduated high school, proceeded to Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana for uh, training as an administrative specialist. Uh, probably like a lot of you, some of the places that I've served at no longer exist today, and they are just a footnote in history. And it takes us getting up and telling our story so that those places are remembered. This morning, the director talked about her experience at Gettysburg. And as I stood in the audience listening this morning, I too had a very similar shared experience at the battlefield in Gettysburg. A few years ago, a uh, commander in chief from the Veterans of Foreign Wars had come in, and he'd like to go horseback riding. Well, we found out in Gettysburg, you can actually tour the battlefield by horseback. And we actually rode up Pickett's Charge. To me, at that point in my life, this was just a couple of years ago, I had been an enlisted soldier, and you'll hear in a little bit that I became also a commissioned officer. So sitting on horseback, we equate to being an officer, a commander, and a leader. So as we rode up that battlefield, I got the perspective of what it's like to be a leader and I thought back to the day of where we had men march 80 to 100 miles, wool uniforms, carrying 100 pounds of weaponry, equipment, immediately thrust into battle. And those gently rolling hills you talk about, that were they talk about, well, they're actually on an incline. So now you have all this going, you have about 100 degree temperature, you're tired, you got all this wool on, you all this equipment, you have the largest cannonade in history at that point, you're under consistent fire, you're 
marching up these rolling hills, going through the pickets, fighting for your life, fighting for your cause, and the leaders that were sitting on horseback were elevated and made a pure target, nice and clear. So being a leader sitting on that horseback, I got the appreciation of what it was like to be in that time and understand the pressures that those individuals were under. But also from my experience, I understood the enlisted perspective of being that foot soldier on the ground trying to minimize yourself as a target and accomplish that mission. It, those stories, those emotions, and those passions need to be remembered. As I said, I uh, graduated high school, went off to my advanced training, came back, joined my Army Reserve unit, and started my uh, college phase of my life where I went to Shippensburg University. And for those of you that uh, have ever seen the movie Animal House, <laughs> I like to think of that as a very good portion of uh, uh, putting together my collegiate career. Uh, but it was a good time, it was good events. I graduated college and now I got to listen to my mother say, okay, time for you to get a job. Well, after uh, about two months of listening to that and not really able to find a position, I was like, well, I'm going to join some friends of mine down at the Jersey Shore and have a little vacation and relax a little bit before I try to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. While sitting at the shore, this individual named Saddam Hussein invades a little known country called Kuwait. And I'm watching it for a few days and like, hmm, this looks like it may get into a larger event. So I uh, went back home, contacted my reserve unit, and I said, uh, I'm unemployed. I need a job. What can I do? And they're like, come on in. We need to get our equipment ready. We don't know what's going to happen. But as a citizen soldier, as an Army reservist, as a National Guardsman, we need to be prepared to support our active component counterparts. So I joined my reserve unit and I'd work off and on throughout the week and then the request came down. Who would like to volunteer? Well, you know what they say about volunteering and uh, for the second time in my life, first time was May 3rd, 1985 when I raised my hand and took that first enlistment well, that day in uh, the summer of 1990, I raised my hand once again and said, I will volunteer to go forward. And it took some time and um, there were, well, we're going to send a lot of units. We're not going to send units. Uh, you know, yes, you're going. No, you're not. A uh, whole variety of situations occurred. And I got the phone call. Mr. Umberger, this is... Um, Deputy uh, such and such from Lebanon County Sheriff's Office, we'd like you to come in for your final interview. And went in, got hired as a deputy sheriff. It's like, fantastic. I can now get my mother off my back. <laughs> so I go in, uh, this is right after Thanksgiving of 1990. I swear in, I get my badge, my uniform, go home for lunch, phone rings. It's my Army Reserve unit, my unit administrator. Uh, Corporal Umberger, uh, we need to speak to you immediately. And I, what's it about? Can't talk to you over the phone, need to see you in person. Go back to my unit. Corporal, you're being transferred to a unit and you're going to be mobilized. And I'm like, okay. So go back into the sheriff's office, turn in my. Uh, uniform and they're like what's going on I said well I'm about to go on an exotic trip for an indefinite amount of time and I understand there's going to be some heat and beach so uh, in uh, no late November early December 1990 I was transferred from a line armor unit a tank in tank unit to a data processing unit where I served as the unit clerk and I remember walking in and I met uh, my Sergeant Major and he looked through my file and he said, oh, I see you come from a combat arms unit. I'm like, yes. He said, well, you make number two. 
I'm like, I make number two what? He said, you make the second person in this unit that's ever been to the field. And I'm like, you're kidding. He's like, no. We are a specialized unit. We have tractor trailer computer vans. We run out of a garrison support unit. So we don't go to the field. This type of unit has the capability to support an entire theater. And that was our mission. When we deployed to uh, Desert Storm, we re uh, deployed to Riyadh, and uh, that's what we did. We ran personnel statistics for the entire theater. And it was a very interesting opportunity, and I said, okay, what do you need me to do? And he said, well, come here with me. And he brought me out to a room about the size of this banquet hall right here, and he said, I need you to look through this room pack up everything that you will need to provide administrative and finance and logistical support to our unit for an indefinite amount of time in a harsh combat theater of operations. I said, oh, is that it? Okay. So uh, it was interesting and then once again it was, oh, uh, you're going to go this state. No, now there's a delay, you're not going to go. Uh, next day, yep, we're back on. So it was back and forth. Uh, and besides the fact that we were gearing up for one of the first major combat operations in quite some time, we had, were right in the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And for those of you that have served, you know if there's ever going to be a military operation, it's going to be during a holiday or an anniversary or a birthday. Something's always going to happen that impacts your life. And when we start talking about the reserve and guard forces, we have that double impact. They have their military career, they have their family, but they have a civilian job. And by doing this, you know, the emotions do the full spectrum swing. One day you're geared up to do this, next day you're geared up to do that. You sometimes don't know which way it's going to happen. Once we arrived in country, uh, we uh, flew out from Andrews Air Force Base on January 3rd, 1991. Uh, flew through Rhine Mine, right into uh, Riyadh, uh, which is the capital of Saudi Arabia. And I flew over on a C-5A uh, transport, one of the large transports where the nose cone opens and the rear tail opens and you can drive vehicles on one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, cargo hauler we have. And I remember being on the first flight of my unit and we touched down and the ramp went down and I walked down and I looked over to my left and I saw a line of uh, palm trees and I was like, oh, that's nice. And then I looked over to this side and I saw a Patriot missile battery set up and I'm like, hmm, picture's starting to get a little more clear. And then I see an Air Force vehicle drive up, and it's pink. When the Air Force had their vehicles uh, on most bases, they were painted blue. Well, in a rush to get them out into the combat theater, they quickly painted them tan. Well, whatever they had in their paint didn't mix well with the blue on the vehicles, and it came out with this pinkish hue. So. Every day I kept telling myself, this is an adventure, this is an adventure, and I saw those pink Air Force vehicles and I'm like, boy, is this gonna be some sort of adventure. <laughs> you know, but we got there, we got set up, um, and I actually had an opportunity to talk to the Patriot, uh, the men and women that manned the Patriot missile battery, and I said, thank you being, for being here to protect us. And they're like, oh, we're not here protecting your unit, we're here as a part of a defense ring for Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, and the largest oil refinery in Saudi Arabia. You just happen to be in our dome of coverage, so you're welcome. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I see the army, once again, it is a little bit lower on the pecking order. But uh, we set up, and this is a picture of our compound. Uh, as you can tell, we were, the Army was not really ready for desert warfare because all of our camouflage was woodland green. 
So we put up our camouflage tents, uh, and so you got this nice big green bush in the middle of the desert. It's like, hmm, where do we target? But, uh, you know, thanks to the sandstorms and all that, it quickly uh, blended right in with everything else. January 15th, 1991 was the deadline uh, given to Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait and return to the original borders. Uh, he did not do that. This is a picture of myself on um, guard duty at an entry control point. Uh, January 16th, about uh, 10 o'clock at night, May 9, 10 o'clock at night. If you remember your history, at 0400, January 17th, the United States began the air war. So when we were taking these uh, pictures, we were having fun, joking, not thinking that uh, anything was going to happen. Little did we know that uh, I had moved from po the position at the entry control point to the position uh, inside my headquarters tent, and uh, the switchboard rang, picked it up, and got the message, all personnel, 100% uh, accountability at your duty stations, mop level two uh, by 0200. Now, I, uh oh, here it comes. We got everybody in position, got everybody accounted for, and then the switchboard rang again. I took it, and I rem still remember it today. Unconfirmed Scud missile launch, Riyadh area, mop level four now, impact 10 minutes. Yeah, and uh, for those of you that have been in these type of situations, you know that pucker factor went real tight. Made the announcement, we all got into our uh, protective gear, we got into our defensive positions, and then all the fireworks began. Uh, fortunately, we had no uh, damage in our area, but when you have a serious situation, you always have a moment of comedy in it as well. And I remember we're all sitting around in our bunker, and the first sergeant's like, we need accountability, we need accountability. Well, we are now in brand new chemical mask, uh, chemical gear. We have our masks on, we have our helmets on. You can't tell who's who. Every piece of equipment we have usually has your name on it. Well, we had just opened up these chemical uh, suits, no names on them. So you're like, who are you? And you, you only got a little eye ring to look in and try to identify anybody. You can't hear each other clearly out of the mask. So uh, it was very comical as we uh, proceeded through uh, that first couple of hours until we got everybody accounted for. But as we know, very quickly, one of the largest coalitions ever put forth uh, together went forward, removed the, one of the largest standing armies in the world within approximately 96 hours, and reestablished the original boundaries of the country of Kuwait. As time went on, we remained there, still continuing to process uh, the personnel information for uh, all the uh, units within the theater. As you can see, we finally got our chocolate chip uniforms. A little late, but better than never. And we continued our operations as we continued to secure the area and reestablish the government of Kuwait. As in uh, any type of conflict, there's always an opportunity to get your uh, pictures. Uh, here I have one in front of a ZSU-24 anti-aircraft gun and a uh, T-72 uh, main battle tank that was captured during the war from the uh, Iraqi forces. And it became an interesting time over there, um, going through everything, the daily operations, just like we would back here in the States. Uh, everybody started to wonder, when are we going to go home? But we kept getting continued in theater, continued in theater. 
Uh, through my position as the unit clerk, I ran a lot of the logistics missions, so I had the opportunity to get into the towns and talk to some of uh, the people in the area. And what I found is they were just like us. They had their Pizza Hut. They had their Dunkin' Donuts. They even had a Dairy Queen. You know, and I had an opportunity to sit down and have tea with them and we talked about different things and you know, I stayed away from the political aspect, but we talked about uh, family and careers and jobs and uh, business and trade and all those different things and it was very interesting to and I realized that you know halfway across the world completely different culture but the basics are the same the same things that concern us concern them am I providing for my family am I making life better for my children and so it was uh, some interesting times, very learning experience for me, and it uh, definitely uh, helped shape who I became throughout the years. While we were there, you know, forces, we like to have our beverage every once in a while and have some fun, and well, over there, alcohol's not permitted, but they do allow near beer and uh, found various forms of non-alcoholic beverage over there. And uh, For one of our picnics, we had uh, Arabic near beer, MRE shelf-stable bread, uh, and Spam on a grill. <laughs> you know, we sat around having fun, played a little volleyball, a little soccer, had that, and you know, we thought we were back home in our local town in the park for a 4th of July uh, picnic or a family reunion. It was just a, uh, it was a fun time and it built the camaraderie. You know, and through all that we eventually came back and became part of America's history. I spend a lot of time through uh, various organizations down in Washington, D.C. And at Memorial Day, I usually take a group down there and we walk the National Mall and we take time to visit each of the memorials and think about the men and women that served in those eras and just exactly what they mean to us. Presently, there is a uh, movement in place to establish the National Desert Shield, Desert Store War Memorial. It, if you're familiar with the National Mall, it is going to be put right across the street at 23rd and Constitution from the Vietnam Veterans Wall. Because in Vietnam, there's a whole variety of aspects and uh, thoughts on how the war was fought. But in Desert Storm, all of the military leaders were Vietnam veterans. They wanted to ensure that the lessons they learned would not go unforgotten. So during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, they brought their lessons learned and they paid them forward. They also said that whenever a veteran now comes home, they do not want them disrespected. They do not want them ignored. They want them to receive a hero's welcome and a thank you. And so that is why the location of the National Desert Storm War Memorial is going to be right across from the Vietnam Veterans Wall to show that linkage, the passing of the baton from one generation to the next. When I came back, I uh, still continue to work part-time for the Sheriff's Department, but I found a new position. It was as a civilian with the Department of the Army, called a military technician. In this capacity, I was an advisor to an Army Reserve unit. I helped them prepare for whatever mission comes next. And through that experience, I, got, I still maintain my Army Reserve membership, 
but I got to share my knowledge and my experiences with them. I got to help prepare them uh, for their mission. And it was a good opportunity to uh, continue to pay it forward like it was paid forward to me. In this capacity, uh, I had the opportunity to meet several general officers. I had an opportunity, this is actually Marianne Hamilton. In December of 1991, she signed me in as a federal government employee. This picture was taken uh, a few years ago, but it was 24 years to the week where I was now her supervisor and I was retiring her with over 40 years of federal civilian service and 42 years of military service. So I got to continue to get to meet good people. I got to be a part of the Army Reserve leadership. This is a Lieutenant General Lucky, the current commander of all Army Reserve forces. And I got to continue to help develop the training programs to make an impact on readiness for our future generations. During the time, I also got to get some unique missions. In uh, the mid-2000s, I got to take a medical mission to the Dominican Republic. And we went up into the mountains of the Dominican Republic and we treated the local population in several villages. We were actually treating over a thousand people a day on a variety of ailments. Um, and it once again brought home the impact of just what we do as a country and with our armed forces. We are ambassadors of goodwill out there. We'll kick your butt if we have to, but we are there to help the people. We want them to succeed. We want to help them be better. And it was a very impactful mission to uh, see the hardships that they face. Uh, we all always hear how some of our generations are not respectful of what we have today. Now, I encourage everyone to go and travel abroad if they're able to and go to these locations and just see how fortunate we truly are here in the United States. Yes, we have some adversity. Yes, we have some troubling times. But I can guarantee you there are places in this world that are a lot worse off than we are on our bad day. Throughout my military career, as I said, it was 33 and a half plus years, uh, 16 of it was serving as an enlisted soldier. And then uh, in 2001, I applied for and received a direct appointment as a Medical Service Corps officer. A few years later, I was promoted to uh, the rank of major, and I thought, well, that's a good career. Start as a private, E1, and make it to Major 04. Uh, I truly enjoyed my time. And then in December of 2018, I said it was time to pass the baton on to the next generation. Uh, one of those lessons came clear to me when um, I was a uh, force health protection officer in a multifunctional medical battalion. And one of my young lieutenants uh, came by and said, well, I'm being a good son today, I'm taking my mother around on her errands, and she would like to meet you. Can I bring her in? And I'm like, sure, please do. As soon as she walked through the doorway, we immediately recognized each other. And at that point, I knew that I was long in the tooth because I am now getting the children of my former soldiers as my soldiers. So it, everything had come full circle. I now realized when I was in as a uh, brash young private what my platoon sergeants probably thought of me. And now I'm sitting here looking at these young kids thinking, thinking the exact same thing. So it, uh, it was a very good career. And as I think, uh, eh, doesn't didn't change too much over the year. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little more fruit salad on the uh, chest. But uh, going into retirement uh, came with mixed emotions. 
When I was a company commander, uh, I had to deploy my best friend to Iraq. And I, talking to his family throughout the, the time of his deployment, going to his son's baseball games and that, it truly was a difficult time because I thought about what happens if he does not come back? How do I tell his 13-year-old son, I'm the individual that deployed him? I'm the one that took away his father. And so those are experiences that are not held just to the reserve forces, but they are also with our active component brethren. Tough decisions, impactful decisions, and they affect not only us, but our families and our communities. Here I am being presented to my retirement flag by a good friend and mentor of mine who recently passed away, uh, past uh, Commander-in-Chief John Bajetsky. Uh, here uh, to my right is a World War II veteran. Alan Q. Jones, past state commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars for Pennsylvania, crossed Europe as an armor crewman with Patton's Third Army. 95 years old, sharp as a whip. Uh, on uh, Memorial Day this year, he said, uh, I want you to march with me in uniform in my town's uh, parade. I'm like, okay, Alan, I'll do that with you. Well, the day before, I did a nine-hour walking tour in Washington, D.C. with uh, several chapters and members of Rolling Thunder, Prisoner of War Missing in Action Advocacy Group. So my legs were shot. But I get there that day, and I said, I don't know about this marching. He said, well, I'm marching. And I'm like, well, I'm not letting a 95-year-old outmarch me, so... Bad legs and all, I made it through there, and uh, it was a very enjoyable experience, and I'm glad I did it. Through my service in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, I qualified to become a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. I didn't join immediately when I came back, uh, although I supported the organization on many events like you're doing here today or parades, uh, but I was just like, I don't know if I want to join. And then I kept seeing all the good things that the Veterans of Foreign Wars does in the community, and I'm like, I, w I want to be a part of that. So I joined, worked my way up through the post district, and then became the state commander in 2015-2016. Only the second Desert Storm uh, veteran to become a uh, VFW state commander for the Department of Pennsylvania. Through that experience, I got to travel once again. Got to go up to an event in Alaska, and this is a, a picture outside the original Iditarod Checkpoint One. I got to go to the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is aboard the uh, uh, Memorial. I got to take fellow veterans down to Washington, D.C., where we could all talk about our history and pay respect and honor those that came before us. This group is the Army uh, veterans outside of the 9-11 Memorial at the Pentagon. We have our Navy and Marine Corps brethren at the Iwo Jima statue and then our Air Force veteran at the Air Force Memorial. As I've been talking about stories and needing to pay it forward, uh, this past Memorial Day, my VFW Post sponsors a Boy Scout, Cub Scout, and Venture Group, and they go out and assist us on putting flags on grave sites. Uh, at this particular cemetery, we have a Medal of Honor recipient as well as a mass uh, revolutionary war grave. And I took, take, we take the opportunity to explain what the revolution meant, why there's a mass grave, what the Medal of Honor means, what individuals do to earn 
that valor, that uh, title, that ribbon. And we also look at the grave markers and we talk about the branches of service. We talk about the ribbons and the units. And we give them something to tie to that, oh, my uncle was in the artillery. Or my grandfather was in the 101st. And they can then link things together and remember it. So hopefully one day they continue to pass that on to the next generation. Uh, this is me speaking at the, that parade, as I said. Once again, sharing with a, a junior ROTC battalion there the stories and the history. I've had the opportunity to be the president of the Pennsylvania War Veterans Council. This council is comprised of all the 15 nationally recognized veteran service organizations in the state of Pennsylvania. It's where we come together and make sure that veterans of all branches of all eras are remembered and recognized. On Memorial Day, uh, my Rolling Thunder chapter, Pennsylvania Chapter 1, we had an honorary member, Medal of Honor recipient, Dave Dolby, and we went to his grave site in Arlington, and we talked about his story and his actions in Vietnam. At the uh, Korean War Memorial, we had a, uh, I did a reading. I remember being there several years ago and as we're walking up, I see a veteran as uh, several of you have in the audience today, you have your service on your hat and I saw a Korean War vet, I went up to thank him for his service and he said, well, you know, I was also in World War II. I said, well, thank you for that as well. And he said, well, I wasn't in World War II too long I was only strafed by the Luftwaffe once. And I said, well, young man, once is good enough for me. Now, uh, this one's a little difficult to see, but uh, I'm at the apex of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the wall, and we're talking about all the men and women that served there. As I talked about, servicemen and women and their family are part of the community. Together, we all are serve in one aspect or another, whether it be those that go forward in harm's way or those that stay here on the home front taking care of everything. Sometimes when uh, individuals return, they have difficulty adjusting getting employment, and they become homeless. Uh, in Delaware Valley stand down on the Philadelphia side, I've been participating for the last 20 years in a homeless veteran stand down where we give those in need a hand up. We help them get associate with their VA benefits. We help them get career counseling. If they need legal counseling, whatever it is, we look to support them. We don't forget them. And that's what today is all about, a day of remembering and recognizing the men and women that have come before us, the things that they have done, and the fact that we must continue to tell their story to make sure that the tough times that we've had, the issues and the losses that we've suffered through continue to be remembered so that hopefully the generations that are coming forward will not have to share in some of that pain and suffering that we did. So on this Veterans Day, I want to thank each and every one of you for your support, for those that have gone forward and have worn the uniform of this great country. I want to thank the families of those service members for what you did to support that veteran as they did their duty. I also want to thank some of the unsung heroes that we often forget about, who today seem to be under a constant sense of attack. That is our local police, fire, and EMS professionals. Without them standing here at home, making sure our families are safe, we that go forward would not be able to do our job 100%
because in the back of our mind we're thinking, is my loved one safe? So I want to thank you all for being here today and thank you for your service. God bless.